Section 15 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 6, Renaissance and Reformation, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Thomas Cranmer, Part 2. Cranmer, now unchecked, turned his attention to other reforms, but proceeded slowly and cautiously, not wishing to hazard much at the outset. First communion of both kinds, heretofore restricted to the clergy, was appointed and, closely connected with it, masses were put down. Then a law was passed by Parliament that the appointment of bishops should vest in the crown alone, and not, as formerly, be confirmed by the Pope. The next great thing to which the Reformers directed their attention was the preparation of a new liturgy in the public worship of God, which gave rise to considerable discussion. They did not seek to sweep away the old form, for it was prepared by the sainted doctors of the Church of all ages, but they would purge it of all superstitions, and retain what was most beautiful and expressive in the old prayers. The Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the early creeds, of course, were retained, as well as whatever was in harmony with primitive usages. These changes called out letters from Calvin at Geneva, who was now recognized as a great oracle among the Protestants. He encouraged the work, but advised a more complete reformation, and complained of the coldness of the clergy, as well as of the general vices of the times. Martin Bucer of Strasbourg, at this time professor at Cambridge, also wrote letters to the same effect, but the time had not come for more radical reforms. Then Parliament, controlled by the government, passed an act allowing the clergy to marry, opposed, of course, by many bishops in allegiance to Rome. This was a great step in reform, and removed many popular scandals. It struck a heavy blow at the superstitions of the Middle Ages, and showed that celibacy sprung from no law of God, but was Oriental in its origin, encouraged by the popes to cement their throne. And this act concerning the marriage of the clergy was soon followed by the celebrated forty-two articles, framed by Cranmer and Ridley, which are the bases of the English Church, a theological creed, slightly amended afterwards in the reign of Elizabeth, evangelical but not Calvinistic, affirming the great ideas of Augustine and Luther as to grace, justification by faith, and original sin, and repudiating purgatory, pardons, the worship and invocation of saints and images, a larger creed than the Nicene or Athanasian, and comprehensive, such as most Protestants might accept. Both this and the Book of Common Prayer were written with consummate taste, were the work of great scholars, moderate, broad, enlightened, conciliatory. The Reformers then gave their attention to an alteration of ecclesiastical laws in reference to matters which had always been decided in ecclesiastical courts. The commissioners, the ablest men in England, thirty-two in number, had scarcely completed their work before the young king died and Mary ascended the throne. We cannot too highly praise the moderation with which the reforms had been made, especially when we remember the violence of the age. There were only two or three capital executions for heresy. Gardiner and Bonner, who opposed the Reformation with unparalleled bitterness, were only deprived of their sees and sent to the tower. The execution of Somerset was the work of politicians, of great noblemen, jealous of his ascendancy. It does not belong to the Reformation, nor do the executions of a few other noblemen. Cranmer himself was a statesman rather than a preacher. He left but few sermons, and these commonplace, without learning or wit or zeal, ordinary exhortations to a virtuous life. The chief thing, outside of the reforms I have mentioned, was the publication of a few homilies for the use of the clergy, too ignorant to write sermons, which homilies were practiced and orthodox, but containing nothing to stir up an ardent religious life. The Bible was also given a greater scope. Everybody could read it if he wished. Public prayer was restored to the people in a language which they could understand, and a few preachers arose who appealed to conscience and reason, like Latimer and Ridley and Hooper and Taylor, but most of them were formal and cold. There must have been great religious apathy, or else these reforms would have excited more opposition on the part of the clergy, who generally acquiesced in the changes. But the Reformation thus far was official. It was not popular. It repressed vice and superstition, but kindled no great enthusiasm. It was necessary for the English reformers and sincere Protestants to go through a great trial, to be persecuted, to submit to martyrdom for the sake of their opinions. The school of heroes and saints has ever been among blazing fires and scaffolds. It was martyrdom which first gave form and power to early Christianity. The first chapter in the history of the early church is the torments of the martyrs. The English Reformation had no great dignity or life until the funeral pyres were lighted. Men had placidly accepted new opinions and had Bibles to instruct them, but it was to be seen how far they would make sacrifices to maintain them. 
this test was afforded by the accession of mary daughter of catherine the spaniard an affectionate and kind-hearted woman enough in ordinary times but a fiend of bigotry like catherine de medicis when called upon to suppress the reformation although on her accession she declared she would force no man's conscience but the first thing she does is to restore the popish bishops for so they were called then by historians and the next thing she does is to restore the mass and the third to shut up cranmer and latimer in the tower attaint and executes them with sundry others like ridley and hooper as well as those great nobles who favored the claims of the lady jane grey and the religious reforms of edward the sixth she reconciles herself with rome and accepts its legate at her court she receives spanish spies and jesuit confessors she marries the son of charles v afterwards philip the second she executes the lady jane grey she keeps the strictest watch on the princess elizabeth who learns in her retirement the art of dissimulation and lying she forms an alliance with spain she makes cardinal pole archbishop of canterbury she gives almost unlimited power to gardiner and bonner who begin a series of diabolical persecutions burning such people as john rogers sanders dr taylor of hadley william hunter and stephen harwood ferreting out all suspected of heresy and confining them in the foulest jails burning even little children mary even takes measures to introduce the inquisition and restore the monasteries everywhere are scaffolds and burnings in three years nearly three hundred people were burned alive often with green wood a small number compared with those who were executed and assassinated in france about this time by catherine de medicis the guises and charles the ninth in those dreadful persecutions which began with the accession of mary it was impossible that cranmer should escape in spite of his dignity rank age and services he could hope for no favor or indulgence from that barose woman in whose sapless bosom no compassion for the protestants ever found admission and still less from those cruel mercenary bigoted prelates whom she selected for her ministers it was not customary in that age for the roman church to spare heretics whether high or low would it forgive him who had overturned the consecrated altars displaced the ritual of a thousand years and revolted from the authority of the supreme head of the christian world would mary suffer him to pass unpunished who had displaced her mother from the nuptial bed and pronounced her own birth to be stained with an ignominious blot and who had exalted a rival to the throne and gardiner and bonner too those bigoted prelates and ministers who would have sent to the flames an unoffending woman if she denied the authority of the pope were not the men to suffer him to escape who had not only overturned the papal power in england but had deprived them of their sees and sent them to the tower no matter how decent the forms of law or respectful the agents of the crown cranmer had not the shadow of a hope and hence he was certainly weak to say the least to trust any deceitful promises made to him what his enemies were bent upon was his recantation as preliminary to his execution and he should have been firm both for his cause and because his martyrdom was sure in an evil hour he listened to the voice of the seducer both life and dignities were promised if he would recant confounded heartbroken old the love of life and the fear of death were stronger for a time than the power of conscience or dignity of character six several times was he induced to recant the doctrines which he had preached and profess an allegiance which could only be a solemn mockery true cranmer came to himself he perceived that he was mocked and felt both grief and shame in view of his apostasy his last hours were glorious never did a good man more splendidly redeem his memory from shame being permitted to address the people before his execution with the hope on the part of his tormentors that he would publicly confirm his recantation he first supplicated the mercy and forgiveness of almighty god and concluded his speech with these memorable words and now i come to the great thing that troubleth my conscience more than anything i ever did or said even the setting forth of writings contrary to the truth which i now renounce and refuse those things written with my own hand contrary to the truth i thought in my heart and writ for fear of death and to save my life and forasmuch as my hand offended in writing contrary to my heart therefore my hand shall first be punished for if i come to the fire it shall first be burned as for the pope i denounce him as christ's enemy and antichrist with all his false doctrines then he was carried away and a great multitude ran after him exhorting him while time was to remember himself coming to the stake says the catholic eyewitness with a cheerful countenance and willing mind he took off his garments in haste and stood upright in his shirt fire being applied he stretched forth his right hand and thrust it into the flame before the fire came to any other part of his body 
when his hand was to be seen sensibly burning he cried with a loud voice this hand hath offended thus died cranmer in the sixty-seventh year of his age after presiding over the church of england above twenty years and having bequeathed a legacy to his countrymen of which they continue to be proud he had not the intrepidity of latimer he was supple to henry the eighth he was weak in his recantation he was not an original genius but he was a man of great breadth of views conciliating wise temperate in reform and discharged his great trust with conscientious adherence to the truth as he understood it the friend of calvin and revered by the protestant world queen mary reigned fortunately but five years and the persecutions she encouraged and endorsed proved the seed of a higher morality and a loftier religious life for thus spake aged latimer i tarry by the stake not trusting in my own weak heart but for the saviour's sake why speak of life or death to me whose days are but a span our crown is yonder ridley see be strong and play the man god helping such a torch this day will light on english land that rome with all her cardinals shall never quench the brand the triumphs of gardiner and bonner were too short mary died with a bruised heart and a crushed ambition on her death and the accession of her sister elizabeth exiles returned from geneva and frankfurt to advocate more radical changes in government and doctrine popular enthusiasm was kindled never afterwards to be repressed the great ideas of the reformation began now to agitate the mind of england not so much the logical doctrines of calvin as the emancipating ideas of luther the renaissance had begun and the two movements were incorporated the religious one of germany and the pagan one of italy both favoring liberality of mind a freer style of literature restless inquiries enterprise the revival of learning and art an intense spirit of progress and disgust for the dark ages and all the dogmas of scholasticism with this spirit of progress and moderate protestantism elizabeth herself the best educated woman in england warmly sympathized as did also the illustrious men she drew to her court to whom she gave the great offices of state i cannot call her age a religious one it was a merry one cheerful inquiring untrammelled in thought bold in speculation eloquent honest fervid courageous hostile to the papacy and all the bigots of europe it was still rough coarse sensual when money was scarce and industries in their infancy and material civilization not very attractive but it was a great age glorious intellectual brilliant with such statesmen as burley and walsingham to head off treason and conspiracy when great poets arose like johnson and spencer and shakespeare and philosophers like bacon and sir thomas brown and lawyers like nicholas bacon and coke and elegant courtiers like sidney and raleigh and essex men of wit men of enterprise who would explore distant seas and colonize new countries yea great preachers like jeremy taylor and hall and great theologians like hooker and chillingworth giving polish and dignity to an uncouth language and planting religious truth in the minds of men elizabeth with such a constellation around her had no great difficulty in re-establishing protestantism and giving it a new impetus although she adhered to liturgies and pomps and loved processions and fetes and banquets and balls and expensive dresses a worldly woman but progressive and enlightened in the religious reforms of that age you see the work of princes and statesmen still rather than any great insurrection of human intelligence or any great religious revival although the germs of it were springing up through the popular preachers and influence of the genevan reformers calvin's writings were potent and john knox was on his way to scotland i pass by rapidly the reforms of elizabeth's reign effected by the queen and her ministers and the convocation of protestant bishops and clergy and learned men in the universities oxford and cambridge were then in their glory crowded with poor students from all parts of england who came to study greek and latin and read theology not to ride horses and row boats to put on dandified airs and sneer at lectures running away to london to attend theatres and flirt with girls and drink champagne begging their fathers and ruining their own expectations and their health in a very short time after the accession of elizabeth which was hailed generally as a very auspicious event things were restored to nearly the state in which they were left by cranmer in the preceding reign this was not done by direct authority of the queen but by acts of parliament even henry the eighth ruled through parliament only it was his tool and instrument elizabeth consulted its wishes as the representation of the nation for she aimed to rule by the affections of her people but she recommended the parliament to conciliatory measures to avoid extremes to drop offensive epithets like papist and heretic 
to go as far as the wants of the nation required and no farther though a zealous protestant she seemed to have no great animosities her particular aversion was bonner the violent bloodthirsty narrow-minded bishop of london who was deprived of his see and shut up in the tower put out of harm's way not cruelly treated he was not even deprived of his good dinners she appointed as her prerogative allowed a very gentle moderate broad kind-hearted man to be archbishop of canterbury parker who had been chaplain to her mother and who was highly esteemed by burley and nicholas bacon her most influential ministers parliament confirmed the old act passed during the reign of henry the eighth making the sovereign the head of the english church although the title of supreme head was left out in the oath of allegiance to conciliate the catholic party to execute this supremacy the court of high commission was established afterwards so abused by charles i the church service was modified and the act of uniformity was passed by parliament after considerable debate the changes were all made in the spirit of moderation and few suffered beyond a deprivation of their sees or livings for refusing to take the oath of supremacy then followed the thirty-nine articles setting forth the creed of the established church substantially the creed which cranmer had made and a new translation of the bible and the regulation of ecclesiastical courts but whatever was done was in good taste marked by good sense and moderation to preserve decency and decorum and repress all extremes of superstition and license the clergy preached in a black gown and genevan bands using the surplice only in the liturgy we see no lace or millinery the churches were stripped of images the pulpits became high and prominent the altars were changed to communion tables without candles and symbols there was not much account made of singing for the lyric version of the psalms was execrable for the first time since chrysostom and gregory nanzianzen preaching became the chief duty of the clergymen and his sermons were long for the people were greedy of instruction and were not critical of artistic merits among other things of note the exiles were recalled who brought back with them the learning of the continent and the theology of geneva and an intense hatred for all the old forms of superstition images crucifixes lighted candles catholic vestments and a supreme regard for the authority of the scriptures rather than the authority of the church these men mostly learned and pious were not contented with the restoration as effected by elizabeth's reformers they wanted greater simplicity of worship and a more definite and logical creed and they made a good deal of trouble being very conscientious and somewhat narrow and intolerant so that after the re-establishment of protestantism the religious history of the reign is chiefly concerned with the quarrels and animosities within the church particularly about vestments and modes of worship things unessential minute technical which lead to great acerbity on both sides and to some persecution for these quarrels provoked the queen and her ministers who wanted peace and uniformity to the government it seems strange and absurd for those returned exiles to make such a fuss about a few externals to these intensified protestants it seemed harsh and cruel that government should insist on such a rigid uniformity and punish them for not doing as they were bidden by the bishops so they separated from the established church and became what were called nonconformists having not only disgust of the decent ritualism of the church but great wrath for the bishops and hierarchy and spiritual courts they also disapproved of the holy days which the church retained and the prayers in the cathedral style of worship the use of the cross and baptism godfathers and godmothers the confirmation of children kneeling at the sacrament bowing at the name of jesus the ring in marriage the surplice and the divine right of bishops and some other things which reminded them of rome for which they had absolute detestation seeing in the old catholic church nothing but abominations and usurpations no religion at all only superstition in anti-christian government and doctrine the reign of the beast the mystic babylon the scarlet mother reveling in the sorceries of ancient paganism these terrible animosities against even the shadows and resemblances of what was called popery were increased and intensified by the persecution and massacres which the catholics about this time were committing on the protestants in france in germany and in the low countries and which filled the people of england especially the middle and lower classes with fear alarm anger and detestation i will not enter upon the dissensions which so early crept into the english church and led to a separation or schism whatever name it goes by to most people in these times not very interesting or edifying because they were not based on any great ideas of universal application and seeming to such minds as bacon and parker and jewell rather narrow and frivolous the great puritan controversy would have no dignity if it were confined to vestments and robes and forms of worship and hatred of ceremonies and holy days and other matters which seemed to lean to romanism 
but the grandeur and the permanence of the movement were in a return to the faith of the primitive church and a purer national morality and to the unrestricted study of the bible and the exaltation of preaching and christian instruction over forms and liturgies and antiphonal chants above all the exaltation of reason and learning in the interpretation of revealed truth and the education of all people in all matters which concern their temporal or religious interests so that a true and rapid progress was inaugurated in civilization itself which has peculiarly marked all protestant countries having religious liberty underneath all these apparently insignificant squabbles and dissensions there were two things of immense historical importance first a spirit of intolerance on the part of government and of church dignitaries the state allied with the church forcing uniformity with their decrees and severely punishing those who did not accept them in matters beyond all worldly authority and secondly a rising spirit of religious liberty determined to assert its glorious rights at any cost or hazard and especially defended by the most religious and earnest part of the clergy who were becoming calvinistic in their creed and were pushing the ideas of the reformation to their utmost logical sequence this spirit was suppressed during the reign of elizabeth out of general respect and love for her as a queen and the external dangers to which the realm was exposed from spain and france which diverted the national mind but it burst out fiercely in the next reigns under james and charles about the beginning of the seventeenth century and this is the last development of the reformation in england to which i can allude the great puritan contest for liberty of worship running when opposed unjustly and cruelly into a contest for civil liberty that is the right to change forms and institutions of civil government even to the dethronement of kings when it was the expressed and declared will of the people in whom was vested the ultimate source of sovereignty but here i must be brief i tread on familiar ground made familiar by all our literature especially by the most brilliant writer of modern times though not the greatest philosopher i mean that great artist and word painter macaulay whose chief excellence is in making clear and interesting and vivid by a world of illustration and practical good sense and marvellous erudition what was obvious to his own objective mind and obvious also to most other enlightened people not much interested in metaphysical disquisitions no man more than he does justice to the love of liberty which absolutely burned in the souls of the puritans that glorious party which produced milton and cromwell and hampton and bunyan and owen and calamy and baxter and howe the chief peculiarity of those puritans once called nonconformists afterwards presbyterians and independents was their reception of the creed of john calvin the clearest and most logical intellect that the reformation produced though not the broadest who reigned as a religious dictator at geneva and in the reformed churches of france and who gave to john knox the positivism and sternness and rigidity which he succeeded in impressing upon the churches of scotland and the peculiar doctrines which marked calvin and his disciples were those deduced from the majesty of god and the comparative littleness of man leading to and bound up with the impotence of the will human dependence the necessity of divine grace augustinian in spirit but going beyond augustine in the subtlety of metaphysical distinctions and dissertations on free will election and predestination unfathomable but exceedingly attractive subjects to the divines of the seventeenth century creating a metaphysical divinity a theology of the brain rather than of the heart a brilliant series of logical and metaphysical deductions from established truths demanding to be received with the same unhesitating obedience as the truths or biblical declarations from which they are deduced the greatness of human reason was never more forcibly shown than in these deductions but they were carried so far as to insult reason itself and mock the consciousness of mankind so that mankind rebelled against the very force of the highest reasonings of the human intellect because they pushed logical sequence into absurdity or to dreadful conclusions decretum quidem horrible fetor said the great master himself the puritans were trained in this theology which developed the loftiest virtues and the severest self-constraints making them both heroes and visionaries always conscientious and sometimes repulsive fitting them for gigantic tasks and unworthy squabbles driving them to the bible and then to acrimonious discussions creating fears almost medieval leading them to technical observation of religious duties and transforming the most genial and affectionate people under the sun into austere saints with whom the most ascetic of monks would have had but little sympathy 
i will not dwell on those peculiarities which macaulay ridicules and taine repeats the hatred of theatres and assemblies and symbolic festivals and bell ringings the rejection of the beautiful the elongated features the cropped hair the unadorned garments the proscription of innocent pleasures the nasal voice the cant phrases the rigid decorums the strict discipline these doubtless exaggerated were more than balanced by the observance of the sabbath family prayers temperate habits fervor of religious zeal strict morality allegiance to duty and the perpetual recognition of god almighty as the sovereign of this world to whom we are responsible for all our acts and even our thoughts they formed a noble material on which every emancipating idea could work men trained by persecutions to self-sacrifice and humble duties making good soldiers good farmers good workmen in every department honest and sturdy patient and self-reliant devoted to their families though not demonstrative of affection keeping the sunday as a day of worship rather than rest or recreation cherishing as the dearest and most sacred of all privileges the right to worship god according to the dictates of conscience enlightened by the bible and willing to fight even amid the greatest privations and sacrifices to maintain this sacred right and transmit it to their children such were the men who fought the battles of civil liberty under cromwell and colonized the most sterile of all american lands making the dreary wilderness to blossom with roses and sending out the shoots of their civilization to conserve more fruitful and favored sections of the great continent which god gave them to try new experiments in liberty and education i need not enumerate the different sects into which these puritans were divided so soon as they felt they had the right to interpret scripture for themselves nor would i detail the various and cruel persecutions to which these sects were subjected by the government and the ecclesiastical tribunals until they rose in indignation and despair and rebelled against the throne and made war on the king and cut off his head all of which they did from fear and for self-defence as well as from vengeance and wrath nor can i describe the counter-reformation the great reaction which succeeded to the violence of the revolution the english reformation was not consummated until constitutional liberty was heralded by the reign of william and mary when the nation became almost unanimously protestant with perfect toleration of religious opinions although the fervor of the puritans had passed away for ever leaving a residuum of deep-seated popular antipathy to all the institutions of romanism and all the ideas of the middle ages the english reformation began with princes and ended with the agitations of the people the german reformation began with people and ended in the wars of princes but both movements were sublime since they showed the force of religious ideas civil liberty is only one of the sequences which exalt the character and dignity of man amid the seductions and impediments of a gilded material life authorities todd's life of cranmer stripes life of cranmer woods annals of the oxford university burnett's english reformation dr lingard's history of england macaulay's essays fuller's church history gilpin's life of cranmer original letters to cromwell hook's lives of the archbishops of canterbury butler's book of the roman catholic church wordsworth's ecclesiastical biography turner's henry the eighth frauda's history of england fox's life of latimer turner's reign of mary End of section 15section 16 of beacon lights of history volume 6 renaissance and reformation by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand ignatius loyola part 1 a d 1491 to 1556 rise and influence of the jesuits next to the protestant reformation itself the most memorable moral movement in the history of modern times was the counter reformation in the roman catholic church finally affected in no slight degree by the jesuits but it has not the grandeur or historical significance of the great insurrection of human intelligence which was headed by luther it was a revival of the pietism of the middle ages with an external reform of manners it was not revolutionary it did not cast off the authority of the popes nor disband the monasteries nor reform religious worship it rather tended to strengthen the power of the popes to revive monastic life and to perpetuate the forms of worship which the middle ages had established no doubt a new religious life was kindled and many of the flagrant abuses of the papal empire were redressed and the lives of the clergy made more decent in accordance with the revival of intelligence 
nor did it disdain literature or art or any form of modern civilization but sought to combine progress with old ideas it was an effort to adapt the roman theocracy to changing circumstances and was marked by expediency rather than right by zeal rather than a profound philosophy this movement took place among the latin races the italians french and spaniards having no hold on the teutonic races except in austria as much slavonic as german it worked on a poor material morally considered among peoples who have not been distinguished for stamina of character earnestness contemplative habits and moral elevation peoples long enslaved frivolous in their pleasures superstitious indolent fond of fetes spectacles pictures and pagan reminiscences the doctrine of justification by faith was not unknown even in italy it was embraced by many distinguished men contarini an illustrious venetian wrote a treatise on it which cardinal pole admired Falengo ascribed justification to grace alone and vittoria colonna the friend of michelangelo took a deep interest in these theological inquiries but the doctrine did not spread it was not understood by the people it was a speculation among scholars and doctors which gave no alarm to the pope there was even an attempt at internal reform under paul the third of the illustrious family of the farnese successor of leo x and clement the seventh the two renowned medician popes he made cardinals of contarini caraffa sadoletto pole ghiberto all men imbued with protestant doctrines and very religious and these good men prepared a plan of reform and submitted it to the pope which ended however only in new monastic orders it was then that ignatius loyola appeared upon the stage when luther was in the midst of his victories and when new ideas were shaking the pontifical throne the desponding successor of the gregories and the clements knew not where to look for aid in that crisis of peril and revolution the monastic orders composed his regular army but they had become so corrupted that they had lost the reverence of the people the venerable benedictines had ceased to be men of prayer and contemplation as in the times of bernard and anselm and were reveling in their enormous wealth the cloisters of the cluniacs and the cistercians branches of the benedictines were filled with idle and dissolute monks the famous dominicans and franciscans who had rallied to the defense of the papacy three centuries before those missionary orders that had filled the best pulpits and the highest chairs of philosophy in the scholastic age had become inexhaustible subjects of sarcasm and mockery for they were peddling relics and indulgences and quarreling amongst themselves they were hated as inquisitors despised as scholastics and deserted as preachers the roads and taverns were filled with them erasmus laughed at them luther abused them and the pope reproached them no hope from such men as these although they had once been renowned for their missions their zeal their learning and their preaching at this crisis loyola and his companions volunteered their services and offered to go wherever the pope should send them as preachers or missionaries or teachers instantly without discussion conditions or rewards so the pope accepted them and made them a new order of monks and they did what the mendicant friars had done three hundred years before they fanned a new spirit and rapidly spread over europe over all the countries to which catholic adventurers had penetrated and became the most efficient allies that the popes ever had this was in fifteen forty six years after the foundation of the society of jesus had been laid on the mount of martyrs in the vicinity of paris during the pontificate of paul the third don inigo lopez de recalde loyola a spaniard of noble blood and breeding at first a page at the court of king ferdinand then a brave and chivalrous soldier was wounded at the siege of pampeluna during a slow convalescence having read all the romances he could find he took up the lives of the saints and became fired with religious zeal he immediately forsook the pursuit of arms and betook himself barefooted to a pilgrimage he served the sick in hospitals he dwelt alone in a cavern practicing austerities he went as a beggar on foot to rome and to the holy land and returned at the age of thirty-three to begin a course of study it was while completing his studies at paris that he conceived and formed the society of jesus from that time we date the counter-reformation in fifty years more a wonderful change took place in the catholic church wrought chiefly by the jesuits 
yea in sixteen years from that eventful night when far above the starlit city the enthusiastic loyola had bound his six companions with irrevocable vows he had established his society in the confidence and affection of catholic europe against the voice of universities the fears of monarchs and the jealousy of the other monastic orders in sixteen years this ridiculed and wandering spanish fanatic had risen to a condition of great influence and dignity second only in power to the pope himself animating the councils of the vatican moving the minds of kings controlling the souls of a numerous fraternity and making his influence felt in every corner of the world before the remembrance of his passionate eloquence his eyes of fire and his countenance of seraphic piety had passed away from the minds of his own generation his disciples had planted their missionary stations among peruvian mines in the marts of the african slave trade among the islands of the indian ocean on the coasts of hindustan in the cities of japan and china in the recesses of canadian forests amid the wilds of the rocky mountains they had the most important chairs in the universities they were the confessors of monarchs and men of rank they had the control of the schools of italy france austria and spain and they had become the most eloquent learned and fashionable preachers in all catholic countries they had grown to be a great institution an organization instinct with life a mechanism endued with energy and will forming a body which could outwatch argus with his hundred eyes and outwork briarius with his hundred arms they had twenty thousand eyes open upon every cabinet every palace and every private family in catholic europe and twenty thousand arms extended over the necks of every sovereign and all their subjects a mighty moral and spiritual power irresponsible irresistible omnipresent connected intimately with the education the learning and the religion of the age yea the prime agents in political affairs the prop alike of absolute monarchies and of the papal throne whose interests they made identical this association instinct with one will and for one purpose has been beautifully likened by dr williams to the chariot in the prophet's vision the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels wherever the living creatures went the wheels went with them wherever those stood these stood when the living creatures were lifted up the wheels were lifted up over against them and their wings were full of eyes round about and they were so high that they were dreadful so of the institution of ignatius one soul swayed the vast mass and every pin and every cog in the machinery consented with its whole power to every movement of the one central conscience luther moved europe by ideas which emancipated millions and set in motion a progress which is the glory of our age loyola invented a machine which arrested this progress and drove the catholic world back again into the superstitions and despotisms of the middle ages retaining however the fear of god and of hell which some among the protestants care very little about what is the secret of such a wonderful success two things first the extraordinary virtues abilities and zeal of the early jesuits and secondly their wonderful machinery and adapting means to an end the history of society shows that no body of men ever obtained a widespread ascendancy never secured general respect unless they deserved it industry produces its fruits learning and piety have their natural results even in the moral world natural law asserts its supremacy hypocrisy and fraud ultimately will be detected no enduring reputation is built upon a lie sincerity and earnestness will call out respect even from foes learning and virtue are lights which are not hid under a bushel enthusiasm creates enthusiasm a lofty life will be seen and honored nor do people entrust their dearest interests except to those whom they venerate and venerate because their virtues shine like the face of a goddess we yield to those only whom we esteem wiser than ourselves moses controlled the israelites because they venerated his wisdom and courage paul had the confidence of the infant churches because they saw his labors bernard swayed his darkened age by the moral power of learning and sanctity the mature judgments of centuries have never reversed the judgments which past ages gave in reference to their master minds all the pedants and sophists of germany cannot whitewash frederick the second or henry the eighth no man in athens was more truly venerated than socrates when he mocked his judges cicero augustine aquinas appeared to contemporaries as they appear to us even hildebrand did not juggle himself into his theocratic chair washington deserved all the reverence he enjoyed and bonaparte himself was worthy of the honors he received so long as he was true to the interests of france 
so of the jesuits there is no mystery in their success the same causes would produce the same results again when catholic europe saw men born to wealth and rank voluntarily parting with their goods and honors devoting themselves to religious duties often in a humble sphere spending their days in schools and hospitals wandering as preachers and missionaries amid privations and in fatigue encountering perils and dangers and hardships with fresh and ever sustained enthusiasm and finally yielding up their lives as martyrs to proclaim salvation to idolatrous savages it knew them to be heroic and believed them to be sincere and honored them in consequence when parents saw that the jesuits entered heart and soul into the work of education winning their pupils hearts by kindness watching their moods directing their minds into congenial studies and inspiring them with generous sentiments they did not stop to pry into their motives and universities when they discovered the superior culture of educated jesuits outstripping all their associates in learning and shedding a light by their genius and erudition very naturally appointed them to the highest chairs and even the people when they saw that the jesuits were not stained by vulgar vices but were hard-working devoted to their labors earnest and eloquent put themselves under their teachings and especially when they added gentlemanly manners good taste and agreeable conversation to their unimpeachable morality and religious fervor they made these men their confessors as well as preachers their lives stood out in glorious contrast with those of the old monks and the regular clergy in an age of infidel levities when the italian renaissance was bearing its worst fruits and when men were going back to pagan antiquity for their pleasures and opinions that the early jesuits blazed with virtues and learning and piety has never been denied although these things have been poetically exaggerated the world was astonished at their intrepidity zeal and devotion they were not at first intriguing or ambitious or covetous they loved their society but they loved still more what they thought was the glory of god ad majorum de gloriam was the motto which was emblazoned on their standard when they went forth as christian warriors to overcome the heresies of christendom and the superstitions of idolaters the jesuit missionary says stephen with his breviary under his arm his beads at his girdle and his crucifix in his hands went forth without fear to encounter the most dreaded dangers martyrdom was nothing to him he knew that the altar which might stream with his blood and the mound which might be raised over his remains would become a cherished object of his fame and an expressive emblem of the power of his religion if i die said xavier when about to visit the cannibal island of del moro who knows but what all may receive the gospel since it is most certain it has ever fructified more abundantly in the field of paganism by the blood martyrs than by the labors of missionaries a sublime truth revealed to him in his whole course of protracted martyrdom and active philanthropy especially in those last hours when on the island of san shan he expired exclaiming as his faded eyes rested on the crucifix in te domine speravi non confundar en aeternum in perils in fastings in fatigues was the life of this remarkable man passed in order to convert the heathen world and in ten years he had traversed a tract of more than twice the circumference of the earth preaching disputing and baptizing until seventy thousand converts it is said were the fruits of his mission my companion said the fearless marquette when exploring the prairies of the western wilderness is an envoy of france to discover new countries and i am an ambassador of god to enlighten them with the gospel lalemant when pierced with the arrows of the iroquois rejoiced that his martyrdom would induce others to follow his example the missions of the early jesuits extorted praises from baxter and panegyric from leibnitz and not less remarkable than these missionaries were those who labored in other spheres loyola himself though visionary and monastic had no higher wish than to infuse piety into the catholic church and to strengthen the hands of him whom he regarded as god's vice-regent somehow or other he succeeded in securing the absolute veneration of his companions so much so that the sainted xavier always wrote to him on his knees his spiritual exercises has ever remained the great textbook of the jesuits a compend of fasts and penances of visions and of ecstasies rivaling saint teresa herself in the rhapsodies of a visionary piety showing the chivalric and romantic ardor of a spanish nobleman directed into the channel of devotion to an invisible lord see this wounded soldier at the siege of pampeluna 
going through all the experiences of a syriac monk in his manresian cave and then turning his steps to paris to acquire a university education associating only with the pious and the learned drawing to him such gifted men as faber and xavier salmeron and lainez borgia and bobadilla and inspiring them with his ideas and his fervor living afterwards at venice with caraffa the future paul the fourth in the closest intimacy preaching at vincenza and forming a new monastic code as full of genius and originality as it was of practical wisdom which became the foundation of a system of government never surpassed in the power of its mechanism to bind the minds and wills of men loyola was a most extraordinary man in the practical turn he gave to religious rhapsodies creating a legislation for his society which made it the most potent religious organization in the world all his companions were remarkable likewise for different traits and excellences which yet were made to combine in sustaining the unity of this moral mechanism Lane had even a more comprehensive mind than loyola it was he who matured the jesuit constitution and afterwards controlled the council of trent a convocation which settled the creed of the catholic church especially in regard to justification and which admitted the merits of christ but attributed justification to good works in a different sense from that understood and taught by luther aside from the personal gifts and qualities of the early jesuits they would not have so marvellously succeeded had it not been for the remarkable constitution that which bound the members of the society together and gave to it a peculiar unity and force the most marked thing about it was the unbounded and unhesitating obedience required of every member to superiors and of these superiors to the general of the order so that there was but one will this law of obedience is as every one knows one of the fundamental principles of all the monastic orders from the earliest times enforced by benedict as well as basil still there was a difference in the vow of obedience the head of a monastery in the middle ages was almost supreme the lord abbot was obedient only to the pope and he sought the interests of his monastery rather than those of the pope but loyola exacted obedience to the general of the order so absolutely that a jesuit became a slave this may seem a harsh epithet there is nothing gained by using offensive words but protestant writers have almost universally made these charges from their interpretation of the constitutions of loyola and lanay and aquaviva a member of the society had no will of his own he did not belong to himself he belonged to his general as in the time of abraham a child belonged to his father and a wife to her husband nay even still more completely he could not write or receive a letter that was not read by his superior when he entered the order he was obliged to give away his property but could not give it to his relatives when he made confession he was obliged to tell his most intimate and sacred secrets he could not aspire to any higher rank than that he held he had no right to be ambitious or seek his own individual interests he was merged body and soul into the society he was only a pin in the machinery he was bound to obey even his own servant if required by his superior he was less than a private soldier in an army he was a piece of wax to be moulded as the superior directed and the superior in his turn was a piece of wax in the hands of the provincial and he again in the hands of the general there were many gradations in rank but every rank was a gradation in slavery the jesuit is accused of having no individual conscience he was bound to do what he was told right or wrong nothing was right and nothing was wrong except as the society pronounced the general stood in the place of god that man was the happiest who was most mechanical every novice had a monitor and every monitor was a spy so strict was the rule of loyola that he kept francis borgia duke of candia three years out of the society because he refused to renounce all intercourse with his family End of section 16. Section 17 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 6, Renaissance and Reformation, by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Ignatius Loyola, Part 2. The Jesuit was obliged to make all natural ties subordinate to the will of the general, and this general was a king more absolute than any worldly monarch, because he reigned over the minds of his subjects. His kingdom was an imperium in imperio. He was chosen for life and was responsible to no one, although he ruled for the benefit of the Catholic Church. 
in one sense a general of the jesuits resembled the prime minister of an absolute monarch say such a man as richelieu with unfettered power in the cause of absolutism and he ruled like richelieu through his spies making his subordinates tools and instruments the general appointed the presidents of colleges and of the religious houses he admitted or dismissed dispensed or punished at his pleasure there was no complaint all obeyed his orders and saw in him the representative of divine providence complaint was sin resistance was ruin it is hard for us to understand how any men could be brought voluntarily to submit to such a despotism but the novice entering the order had to go through terrible discipline to be a servant anything to live according to rigid rules so that his spirit was broken by mechanical duties he had to learn all the virtues of a slave before he could be fully enrolled in the society he was drilled for years by spiritual sergeants more rigorously than a soldier in napoleon's army hence the efficiency of the body it was a spiritual army of the highest disciplined troops loyola had been a soldier he knew what military discipline could do how impotent an army is without it what an awful power it is with discipline and the severer the better the best soldier of a modern army is he who has become an unconscious piece of machinery and it was this unreflecting unconditional obedience which made the society so efficient and the general himself who controlled it such an awful power for good or for evil i am only speaking of the organization the machinery the regime of the jesuits not of their character not of their virtues or vices this organization is to be spoken of as we speak of the discipline of an army wise or unwise as it reached its end the original aim of the jesuits was the restoration of the papal church to its ancient power and for one hundred years as i think the restoration of morals higher education greater zeal in preaching in short a reformation within the church jesuitism was of course opposed to protestantism it hated the protestants it hated their religious creed and their emancipating and progressive spirit it hated religious liberty i need not dwell on the other things which made this order of monks so successful not merely their virtues and their mechanism but their adaptation to the changing spirit of the times they threw away the old dresses of monastic life they quitted the cloister and places of meditation they were preachers as well as scholars they accommodated themselves to the circumstances of the times they wore the ordinary dress of gentlemen they remained men of the world of fine manners and cultivated speech there was nothing ascetic or repulsive about them like other monks they were all things to all men like politicians in order to accomplish their ends they were never lazy or profligate or luxurious if their order became enriched they as individuals remained poor the inferior members were not even ambitious like good soldiers they thought of nothing but the work assigned to them their pride and glory were the prosperity of their order an intense esprit de corps never equalled by any body of men this of course while it gave them efficiency made them narrow they could see the needle on the barn door they could not see the door itself hence there could be no agreement with them no argument with them except on ordinary matters they were as zealous as saul seeking to make proselytes they yielded nothing except in order to win they never compromised their order in their cause their fidelity to their head was marvellous and so long as they confined themselves to the work of making people better i think they deserve praise i do not like their military organization but i should have no more right to abuse it than the organization of some protestant sects that is a matter of government all sects and all parties catholic and protestant have a right to choose their own government to carry out their ends even as military generals have a right to organize their forces in their own way the history of the jesuits shows this that an organization of forces or what we call discipline or government is a great thing a church without a government is a poor affair so far as efficiency is concerned all churches have something to learn from the jesuits in the way of discipline john wesley learned something the independents learned very little but there is another side to the jesuits we have seen why they succeeded we have to inquire how they failed if history speaks of the virtues of the early members and the wonderful mechanism of their order and their great success in consequence it also speaks of the errors they committed by which they lost the confidence they had gained from being the most popular of all the adherents of the papal power and of the ideas of the dark ages they became the most unpopular they became so odious that the pope was obliged by the pressure of public opinion and of the bourbon courts of europe to suppress their order the fall of the jesuits was as significant as their rise 
i need not dwell on that fall which is one of the best known facts of history why did the jesuits become unpopular and lose their influence they gained the confidence of catholic countries because they deserved it and they lost that confidence because they deserved to lose it in other words because they became corrupt and this seems to be the history of all institutions it is strange it is passing strange that human societies and governments and institutions should degenerate as soon as they become rich and powerful but such is the fact a sad commentary on the doctrine of a necessary progress of the race or the natural tendency to good which so many cherish but than which nothing can be more false as proved by experience and the scriptures why were the antediluvians swept away why could not those races retain their primitive revelation why did the descendants of noah become almost idolaters before he was dead why did the great persian empire become as effeminate as the empires it had supplanted why did the jewish nation steadily retrograde after david why did not civilization and christianity save the roman world why did christianity itself become corrupted in four centuries why did not the middle ages preserve the evangelical doctrines of augustine and jerome and chrysostom and ambrose why did the light of the glorious reformation of luther nearly go out in the german cities and universities why did the fervor of the puritans burn out in england in one hundred years why have the doctrines of the pilgrim fathers become unfashionable in those parts of new england where they seem to have taken the deepest root why have so many of the descendants of the disciples of george fox become so liberal and advanced as to be enamored of silk dresses and laces and diamonds and the ritualism of episcopal churches is it an improvement to give up a simple life and lofty religious enthusiasm for materialistic enjoyments and epicurean display is there a true advance in a university when it exchanges its theological teachings and its preparation of poor students for the gospel ministry for schools of technology and boat clubs and accommodations for the sons of the rich and worldly now the society of jesus went through just such a transformation as has taken place almost within the memory of living men in the life and habits and ideas of the people of boston and philadelphia and in the teachings of their universities some may boldly say why not this change indicates progress but this progress is exactly similar to that progress which the jesuits made in the magnificence of their churches in the wealth they had hoarded in their colleges in the fashionable character of their professors and confessors and preachers in the adaptation of their doctrines to the taste of the rich and powerful in the elegance and arrogance and worldliness of their dignitaries father la chaise was an elegant and most polished man of the world and travelled in a coach with six horses if he had not been such a man he would not have been selected by louis the fourteenth for his confidential and influential confessor the change which took place among the jesuits arose from the same causes as the change which has taken place among methodists and quakers and puritans this change i would not fiercely condemn for some think it is progress but is it progress in that religious life which early marked these people or a progress towards worldly and epicurean habits which they arose to resist and combat the early jesuits were visionary fanatical strict ascetic religious and narrow they sought by self-denying labors and earnest exhortations like savonarola at florence to take the church out of the hands of the devil and the people reverenced them as they always have reverenced martyrs and missionaries the later jesuits sought to enjoy their wealth and power and social position they became as rich and prosperous people generally become proud ambitious avaricious and worldly they were as elegant as scholarly and as luxurious as the fellows of oxford university and the occupants of stalls in the english cathedrals that is all as worldly as the professors of yale and cambridge may become in half a century if rich widows and brewers and bankers without children shall some day make those universities as well endowed as jesuits colleges were in the eighteenth century that is the old story of our fallen humanity i would no more abuse the jesuits because they became confessors to the great and went into mercantile speculations than i would rich and favored clergymen in protestant countries who prefer ten per cent for their money in california mines to four per cent in the national consuls but the prosperity which the jesuits had earned during their first century of existence excited only envy and destroyed the reverence of the people 
it had not made them odious detestable it was the means they adopted to perpetuate their influence after early virtues had passed away which caused enlightened catholic europe to mistrust them and the protestants absolutely to hate and vilify them from the very first the society was distinguished for the esprit de corps of its members of all things which they loved best it was the power and glory of the society just as oxford fellows love the prestige of their university and this power and influence the jesuits determined to preserve at all hazards and by any means when virtues fled they must find something else with which to bolster themselves up they must not part with their power the question was how should they keep it first they adopted the doctrine of expediency that the ends justify the means they did not invent the sophistry it is as old as our humanity abraham used it when he told lies to the king of egypt to save the honor of his wife caesar accepted it when he vindicated imperialism as the only way to save the roman empire from anarchy most politicians resort to it when they wish to gain their ends politicians have ever been as unscrupulous as the jesuits in adopting expediency rather than eternal right it has been a primal law of government it lies at the basis of english encroachments in india and of the treatment of the aborigines in this country by our government there is nothing new in the doctrine of expediency but the jesuits are accused of pushing this doctrine to its remotest consequences of being its most unscrupulous defenders so that jesuitism and expediency are synonymous are convertible terms they are accused of perverting education of abusing the confessional of corrupting moral and political philosophy of conforming to the inclinations of the great they even went so far as to inculcate mental reservation thus attacking truth in its most sacred citadel the conscience of mankind on which pascal was so severe they made habit and bad example almost a sufficient exculpation from crime perjury was allowable if the perjured were inwardly determined not to swear they invented the notion of probabilities according to which a person might follow any opinion he pleased although he knew it to be wrong provided authors of reputation had defended that opinion a man might fight a duel if by refusing to fight he would be stigmatized as a coward they did not openly justify murder treachery and falsehood but they excused the same if plausible reasons could be urged in their missions they aimed at eclat and hence merely nominal conversations were accepted because these swelled their numbers they gave the crucifix which covered up all sins they permitted their converts to retain their ancient habits and customs in order to be popular robert de nobili it is said traced his lineage to brahma and one of their missionaries among the indians told the savages that christ was a warrior who scalped women and children anything for an outward success under their teachings it was seen what a light affair it was to bear the yoke of christ so monarchs retained in their service confessors who imposed such easy obligations so ordinary people resorted to the guidance of such leaders who made themselves agreeable the jesuit colleges were filled with casuists their whole moral philosophy if we may believe arnauld and pascal was a tissue of casuistry truth was obscured in order to secure popularity even the most diabolical persecution was justified if heretics stood in the way father letelier rejoiced in the slaughter of saint bartholomew and te deums were offered in the churches for the extinction of protestantism by any means if it could be shown to be expedient the jesuits excused the most outrageous crimes ever perpetrated on this earth again the jesuits are accused of riveting fetters on the human mind in order to uphold their power and to sustain the absolutism of the popes and the absolutism of kings to which they were equally devoted they taught in their schools the doctrine of passive obedience they aimed to subdue the will by rigid discipline they were hostile to bold and free inquiries they were afraid of science they hated such men as galileo pascal and bacon they detested the philosophers who prepared the way for the french revolution they abominated the protestant idea of private judgment they opposed the progress of human thought and were enemies alike of the jansenist movement in the seventeenth century and of the french revolution in the eighteenth they upheld the absolutism of louis the fourteenth and combated the english revolution they sent their spies and agents to england to undermine the throne of elizabeth and build up the throne of charles i every emancipating idea in politics and in religion they detested there were many things in their system of education to be commended 
they were good classical scholars and taught greek and latin admirably they cultivated the memory they made study pleasing but they did not develop genius the order never produced a great philosopher the energies of its members were concentrated in imposing a despotic yoke the jesuits are accused further of political intrigues this is a common and notorious charge they sought to control the cabinets of europe they had their spies in every country the intrigues of campion and parsons in england aimed at the restoration of the catholic monarchs mary of scotland was a tool in their hands and so was madame de montillon in france the chaise and letelier were mere politicians the jesuits were ever political priests the history of europe the last three hundred years is full of their cabals their political influence was directed to the persecution of protestants as well as infidels they are accused of securing the revocation of the edict of nantes one of the greatest crimes in the history of modern times which led to the expulsion of four hundred thousand protestants from france and the execution of four hundred thousand more they incited the dragonades of louis the fourteenth who was under their influence they are accused of the assassination of kings of the fires of smithfield of the gunpowder plot of the cruelties inflicted by alva of the thirty years war of the ferocities of the guises of inquisitions and massacres of sundry other political crimes with what justice i do not know but certain it is they became objects of fear and incurred the hostilities of catholic europe especially of all liberal thinkers and their downfall was demanded by the very courts of europe why did they lose their popularity why were they so distrusted and hated the fact that they were hated is most undoubted and there must have been a cause for it it is a fact that at one time they were respected and honored and deserved to be so must there not have been grave reasons for the universal change in public opinion respecting them the charges against them to which i have alluded must have had foundation they did not become idle gluttonous ignorant and sensual like the old monks they became greedy of power and in order to retain it resorted to intrigues conspiracies and persecutions they corrupted philosophy and morality abused the confessional privilege adopted success as their watchword without regard to the means they are charged with becoming worldly ambitious mercenary unscrupulous cruel above all they sought to bind the minds of men with a despotic yoke and waged war against all liberalizing influences they always were from first to last narrow pedantic one-sided legal technical pharisaical the best thing about them in the days of their declining power was that they always opposed infidel sentiments they hated voltaire and rousseau and the encyclopedists as much as they did luther and calvin they detested the principles of the french revolution partly because those principles were godless partly because they were emancipating of course in such an infidel and revolutionary age as that of louis the fifteenth when voltaire was the oracle of europe when from his chateau near geneva he controlled the minds of europe as calvin did two centuries earlier enemies would rise up on all sides against the jesuits their most powerful and bitter foe was a woman the mistress of louis the fifteenth the infamous madame de pompadour she hated the jesuits as catherine de medici hated the calvinists in the times of charles the ninth not because they were friends of absolutism not because they wrote casuistic books not because they opposed the liberal principles not because they were spies and agents of rome not because they perverted education not because they were boastful and mercenary missionaries or cunning intriguers in the courts of princes not because they had marked their course through europe in a trail of blood but because they were hostile to her ascendancy a woman who exercised about the same influence in france as jezebel did at the court of ahab i respect the jesuits for the stand they took against this woman it is the best thing in their history but here they did not show their usual worldly wisdom and they failed they were judicially blinded the instrument of the humiliation was a wicked woman so strange are the ways of providence he chose esther to save the jewish nations and a harlot to punish the jesuits she availed herself of their mistakes it seems that the superior of the jesuits at martinique failed for the jesuits embarked in commercial speculations while officiating as missionaries the angry creditors of la valette the jesuit banker demanded repayment from the order they refused to pay his debts the case was carried to the courts and the highest tribunal decided against them 
that was not the worst in the course of the legal proceedings the mysterious rule of the jesuits that which was so carefully concealed from the public was demanded then all was revealed all that pascal had accused them of and the whole nation was indignant a great storm was raised the parliament of paris decreed the constitution of the society to be fatal to all government the king wished to save them for he knew that they were the best supporters of the throne of absolutism but he could not resist the pressure the torrent of public opinion the entreaties of his mistress the arguments of his ministers he was compelled to demand from the pope the abrogation of their charter other monarchs did the same all the bourbon courts in europe for the king of portugal narrowly escaped assassination from a fanatical jesuit had the jesuits consented to a reform they might not have fallen but they would make no concessions said ricci their general sint un sunt aut non sint the pope clement the fourteenth was obliged to part with his best soldiers europe catholic europe demanded the sacrifice the kings of spain of france of naples of portugal compulsus feci compulsus feci exclaimed the broken-hearted pope the feeble and pious ganganelli so that in seventeen seventy three by a papal decree the order was suppressed six hundred sixty nine colleges were closed two hundred twenty three missions were abandoned and more than twenty two thousand members were dispersed i do not know what became of their property which amounted to about two hundred millions of dollars in the various countries of europe this seems to me to have been a clear case of religious persecution incited by jealous governments and the infidel or the progressive spirit of the age on the eve of the french revolution it simply marks the hostilities which for various reasons they had called out i am inclined to think that their faults were greatly exaggerated but it is certain that so severe and high-handed a measure would not have been taken by the pope had it not seemed to him necessary to preserve the peace of the church had they been innocent the pope would have lost his throne sooner than commit so great a wrong on his most zealous servants it is impossible for a protestant to tell how far they were guilty of the charges preferred against them i do not believe that their lives as a general thing were a scandal sufficient to justify so sweeping a measure but their institution their regime their organization their constitution were deemed hostile to liberty and the progress of society and if zealous governments catholic princes themselves should feel that the jesuits were opposed to the true progress of nations how much more reason had protestants to distrust them and to rejoice in their fall and it was not until the french revolution and the empire of napoleon had passed away not until the bourbons had been restored nearly half a century that the order was re-established and again protected by the papal court they have now regained their ancient power and seem to have the confidence of catholic europe some of their most flourishing seminaries are in the united states they are certainly not a scandal in this country although their spirit and institution are the same as ever mistrusted and disliked and feared by the protestants as a matter of course as such a powerful organization naturally would be hostile still to the circulation of the scriptures among the people and free inquiry and private judgment in short to all the ideas of the reformation but whatever they are and however much the protestants dislike them they have in our country this land of unbounded religious toleration the same right to their religion and their ecclesiastical government that protestant sects have and if protestants would nullify their influence so far as it is bad they must outshine them in virtues in a religious life in zeal and in devotion to the spiritual interests of the people if the jesuits keep better schools than protestants they will be patronized and if they command the respect of the catholics for their virtues and intelligence whatever may be the machinery of their organization they will retain their power and not until they interfere with elections and protestant schools or teach dangerous doctrines of public morality has our government any right to interfere with them they will stand or fall as they win the respect or excite the wrath of enlightened nations but the principles they are supposed to defend expediency casuistry and hostility to free inquiry and the circulation of the scriptures in vernacular languages these are just causes of complaint and of unrelenting opposition among all those who accept the great ideas of the protestant reformation since they are antagonistic to what we deem most precious in our institutions <laughs>
so long as the contest shall last between good and evil in this world we have a right to declaim against all encroachments on liberty and sound morality and an evangelical piety from any quarter whatever and we are recreant to our duties unless we speak our minds hence from the light i have i pronounce judgment against the society of jesus as a dangerous institution unfortunately planted among us but which we cannot help and can attack only with the weapons of reason and truth and yet i am free to say that for my part i prefer even the jesuit discipline and doctrines much as i dislike them to the unblushing infidelity which has lately been propagated by those who call themselves savants and which seems to have reached and even permeated many of the schools of science the newspapers periodicals clubs and even pulpits of this materialistic though progressive country i make war on the slavery of the will and a religion of formal technicalities but i prefer these evils to a godless rationalism and the extinction of the light of the faith authorities secreta monita steinmetz's history of the jesuits rank's history of the popes spiritual exercises encyclopedia britannica biographie universae fall of the jesuits by saint priest lives of ignatius loyola aquaviva lanay salmeron borgia zaver bobadilla pascal's provincial letters bonauer's cretinu lingard's history of england tierney lettres edificantes jesuit missions memoirs secrets du cardinal dubois tanner's societas jesu dodd's church history end of section seventeen Section 18 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 6, Renaissance and Reformation by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. John Calvin, Part 1. A.D. 1509 to 1564. Protestant Theology. John Calvin was preeminently the theologian of the Reformation and stamped his genius on the thinking of his age equally an authority with the swiss the dutch the huguenots and the puritans his vast influence extends to our own times his fame as a benefactor of mind is immortal although it cannot be said that he is as much admired and extolled now as he was fifty years ago nor was he ever a favorite with the english church he has been even grossly misrepresented by theological opponents but no critic or historian has ever questioned his genius his learning or his piety no one denies that he has exerted a great influence on protestant countries as a theologian he ranks with st augustine and thomas aquinas maintaining essentially the same views as those held by these great lights and being distinguished for the same logical power reigning like them as an intellectual dictator in the schools but not so interesting as they were as men and he was more than a theologian he was a reformer and legislator laying down the rules of government organizing church discipline and carrying on reforms in the worship of god second only to luther his labors were prodigious as theologian commentator and ecclesiastical legislator and we are surprised that a man with so feeble a body could have done so much work calvin was born in picardy in fifteen o nine the year that henry the eighth ascended the british throne and the year that luther began to preach at wittenberg he was not a peasant's son like luther but belonged to what the world calls a good family intellectually he was precocious and received an excellent education at a college in paris being destined for the law by his father who sent him to the university of orleans and then to borgias where he studied under eminent jurists and made the acquaintance of many distinguished men his conversion took place about the year fifteen twenty nine when he was twenty and this gave a new direction to his studies and his life he was a pale-faced young man with sparkling eyes sedate and earnest beyond his years he was twenty-three when he published the books of seneca on clemency with learned commentaries at the age of twenty-three he was in communion with the reformers of germany and was acknowledged to be even at that early age the head of the reform party in france in fifteen thirty three he went to paris then as always the centre of the national life where the new ideas were creating great commotion in scholarly and ecclesiastical circles and even in the court itself giving offence to the doctors of the sorbonne for his evangelical views as to justification he was obliged to seek refuge with the queen of navarre whose castle at pau was the resort of persecuted reformers 
after leading rather a fugitive life in different parts of france he retreated to switzerland and at twenty-six published his celebrated institutes which he dedicated to francis i hoping to convert him to the protestant faith after a short residence in italy at the court of the duchess of ferrara he took up his abode at geneva and his great career began geneva a city of the allobroges in the time of caesar possessed at this time about twenty thousand inhabitants and was a free state having a constitution somewhat like that of florence when it was under the control of savonarola it had rebelled against the duke of savoy who seems to have been in the fifteenth century its patron ruler the government of this little savoyard state became substantially like that which existed among the swiss cantons the supreme power resided in the council of two hundred which alone had the power to make or abolish laws there was a lesser council of sixty for diplomatic objects only the first person who preached the reformed doctrines in geneva was the missionary farel a french nobleman spiritual romantic and zealous he had great success although he encountered much opposition and wrath but the reformed doctrines were already established in zurich Bern, and basley chiefly through the preaching of ulrich zwingli and oecolampadius the apostolic farel welcomed with great cordiality the arrival of calvin then already known as an extraordinary man though only twenty-eight years of age he came to geneva poor and remained poor all his life all his property at his death amounted to only two hundred dollars as a minister in one of the churches he soon began to exert a marvellous influence he must have been eloquent for he was received with enthusiasm this was in fifteen thirty six but he soon met with obstacles he was worried by the anabaptists and even his orthodoxy was impeached by one caroli who made much mischief so that calvin was obliged to publish his genevan catechism in latin he also offended many by his outspoken rebuke of sin for he aimed at a complete reformation of morals like latimer in london and like savonarola at florence he sought to reprove amusements which were demoralizing or thought to be so in their influence the passions of the people were excited and the city was torn by parties and such was the reluctance to submit to the discipline of the ministers that they refused to administer the sacraments this created such a ferment that the syndics expelled calvin and farel from the city they went at first to burn but the bernese would not receive them they then retired to basley wearied wet and hungry and from basley they went to strasburg it was in this city that calvin dwelt three years spending his time in lecturing on divinity in making contributions to exegetical theology in perfecting his institutes forming a close alliance with melanchthon and other leading reformers so preoccupied was he with his labors as a commentator of the scriptures that he even contemplated withdrawing from the public service of religion calvin was a scholar as well as a theologian and quiet labors in his library were probably more congenial to his tastes than active parochial duties his highest life was amid his books in serene repose and lofty contemplation at this time he had an extensive correspondence his advice being much sought for its wisdom and moderation his judgment was almost unerring since he was never led away by extravagances or enthusiasm a cold calm man even among his friends and admirers he had no passions he was all intellect it would seem that in his exile he gave lectures on divinity being invited by the council of strasburg and also interested himself in reference to the sacrament of the lord's supper which he would withhold from the unworthy he lived quietly in his retreat and was much respected by the people of the city where he dwelt in fifteen thirty nine a convention was held at frankfurt at which calvin was present as the envoy of the city of strasburg here for the first time he met melanchthon but there was no close intimacy between them until these two great men met in the following year at a diet which was summoned at worms by the emperor charles v in order to produce concord between the catholics and protestants and which was afterwards removed to ratisbon melanchthon represented one party and dr eck the other melanchthon and bucer were inclined to peace and cardinal contrarini freely offered his hand agreeing with the reformers to adopt the idea of justification as his starting point allowing that it proceeds from faith without any merit of our own but like luther and calvin he opposed any attempt at union which might compromise the truth and had no faith in the movement neither party as it was to be expected was satisfied the main subject of the dispute was in reference to the eucharist calvin denied the real presence of christ in the sacrament regarding it as a symbol though one of special divine influence but on this point the catholics have been ever uncompromising from the times of berenger 
nor was luther fully emancipated from catholic doctrine modifying without essentially changing it calvin maintained that this is my body meant that it signified my body in regard to original sin and free will as represented by augustine there was no dispute but much difficulty attended the interpretation of the doctrine of justification the greatest difficulty was in reference to the doctrine of transubstantiation which was rejected by the reformers because it had not the sanction of the scriptures and when it was found that this caused insuperable difficulties about the lord's supper it was thought useless to proceed to other matters like confession masses for the dead and the withholding the cup from the laity there was not so great a difference between the catholic and protestant theologians concerning the main body of dogmatic divinity as is generally supposed the fundamental questions pertaining to god the trinity the mission and divinity of christ original sin free will grace predestination had been formulated by thomas aquinas with as much severity as by calvin the great subjects at issue in a strictly theological view were justification and the eucharist respecting free will and predestination the catholic theologians have never been agreed among themselves some siding with augustine like aquinas bernard and anselm and some with pelagius like abelard and Linnaeus, the jesuit at the council of trent a council assembled by the pope with the concurrence of charles v of germany and francis i of france the decrees of which against the authority of augustine in this matter seem to be now the established faith of the roman catholic church after the diet of ratisbon calvin returned to geneva at the eager desire of the people the great council summoned him to return every voice was raised for him calvin that learned and righteous man they said it is he whom we would have as the minister of the lord yet he did not willingly return he preferred his quiet life at strasburg but obeyed the voice of conscience on the thirteenth of september fifteen forty one he returned to his penitent congregation and was received by the whole city with every demonstration of respect and a cloth cloak was given him as a present which he seemed to need the same year he was married to a widow, Idolette de Bury, who was a worthy, well-read, high-minded woman, with whom he lived happily for nine years until her death. She was superior to Luther's wife, Catherine Bora, in culture and dignity, and was a helpmate who never opposed her husband in the slightest matter, always considering his interests. Esteem and friendship seem to have been the basis of this union, not passionate love, which Calvin did not think much of when his wife died it seemed he mourned for her with decent grief but did not seek a second marriage perhaps because he was unable to support a wife on his small stipend as she would wish and expect he rather courted poverty and refused reasonable gratuities his body was attenuated by fasting and study like that of st bernard when he was completing his institutes he passed days without eating and nights without sleeping and as he practised poverty he had a right to inculcate it he kept no servant lived in a small tenement and was always poorly clad he derived no profit from any of his books and the only present he ever consented to receive was a silver goblet from the lord of varennes luther's stipend was four hundred and fifty florins and he too refused a yearly gift from the booksellers of four hundred dollars not wishing to receive a gratuity for his writings calvin's salary was only fifty dollars per year with a house twelve measures of corn and two pipes of wine for tea and coffee were then unknown in europe and wine seems to have been the usual beverage after water he was preeminently a conscientious man not allowing his feelings to sway his judgment he was sedate and dignified and cheerful though Bousset accuses him of a surly disposition un genre triste un esprit chagrin though formal and stern women never shrank from familiar conversation with him on the subject of religion though intolerant of error he cherished no personal animosities calvin was more refined than luther and never like him gave vent to coarse expressions he had not luther's physical strength nor his versatility of genius nor as a reformer was he so violent luther aroused calvin tranquilized the one stormed the great citadel of error the other furnished the weapons for holding it after it was taken the former was more popular the latter appealed to a higher intelligence the saxon reformer was more eloquent the swiss reformer was more dialectical the one advocated unity the other theocracy luther was broader calvin engrafted on his reforms the old testament observances the watchword of the one was grace that of the other was predestination luther cut knots calvin made systems luther destroyed calvin legislated his great principle of government was aristocratic he wished to see both church and state governed by a select few of able men in all his writings we see no trace of popular sovereignty he interested himself like savonarola in political institutions but would separate the functions of the magistracy from those of the clergy and he clung to the notion of a theocratic government like jewish legislators and the popes themselves 
the idea of a theocracy was the basis of calvin's system of legislation as it was that of leo the first he desired that the temporal power should rule in the name of god should be the arm by which spiritual principles should be enforced he did not object to the spiritual domination of the popes so far as it was in accordance with the word of god he wished to realize the grand idea which the middle ages sought for but sought for in vain that the church must always remain the mother of spiritual principles but he objected to the exercise of temporal power by churchmen as well as to the interference of the temporal power in matters purely spiritual virtually the doctrine of anselm and becket but unlike becket calvin would not screen clergymen accused of crime from temporal tribunals he rather sought the humiliation of the clergy in temporal matters he also would destroy inequalities of rank and do away with church dignitaries like bishops and deans and archdeacons and he instituted twice as many laymen as clergymen in ecclesiastical assemblies but he gave to the clergy the exclusive right to excommunicate and to regulate the administration of the sacraments he was himself a high churchman in this spirit both in reference to the divine institution of the presbyterian form of government and the ascendancy of the church as a great power in the world calvin exercised a great influence on the civil polity of geneva although it was established before he came to the city he undertook to frame for the state a code of morals he limited the freedom of the citizens and turned the old democratic constitution into an oligarchy the general assembly which met twice a year nominated syndics or judges but nothing was proposed in the general assembly which had not previously been considered in the council of the two hundred and nothing in the latter which had not been brought before the council of sixty nor even in this which had not been approved by the lesser council the four syndics with their council of sixteen had power of life and death and the whole public business of the state was in their hand the supreme legislation was in the council of two hundred which was much influenced by ecclesiastics or the consistory if a man not forbidden to take the sacrament neglected to receive it he was condemned to banishment for a year one was condemned to do public penance if he omitted a sunday service the military garrison was summoned to prayers twice a day the judges punished severely all profanity as blasphemy a mason was put in prison three days for simply saying when falling from a building that it must be the work of the devil a young girl who insulted her mother was publicly punished and kept on bread and water and a peasant boy who called his mother a devil was publicly whipped a child who struck his mother was beheaded adultery was punished with death a woman was publicly scourged because she sang common songs to a psalm tune and another because she dressed herself in a frolic in man's attire brides were not allowed to wear wreaths in their bonnets gamblers were set in the pillory and card-playing and ninepins were denounced as gambling heresy was punished with death and in sixty years one hundred and fifty people were burned to death in geneva for witchcraft legislation extended to dress and private habits many innocent amusements were altogether suppressed also holidays and theatrical exhibitions excommunication was as much dreaded as in the medieval church in regard to the worship of god calvin was opposed to splendid churches and to all ritualism he retained psalm singing but abolished the organ he removed the altar the crucifix and muniments from the churches and closed them during the weekdays unless the minister was present he despised what we called art especially artistic music nor did he have much respect for artificial sermons or the art of speaking he himself preached ex tempore nor is there evidence that he ever wrote a sermon respecting the eucharist calvin took a middle course between luther and zwingli believing neither in the actual presence of christ in the consecrated bread nor regarding it as a mere symbol but a means by which divine grace is imparted a mirror in which we may contemplate christ baptism he considered only as an indication of divine grace and not essential to salvation thereby differing from luther and the catholic church yet he was as strenuous in maintaining these sacraments as a catholic priest and made excommunication as fearful a weapon as it was in the middle ages for admission to the lord's supper and thus to the membership of the visible church it would seem that his requirements were not rigid but rather very simple like those of the primitive christians namely faith in god and faith in christ without any subtle and metaphysical creeds such as one might expect from his inexorable theological deductions but he would resort to excommunication as a discipline as the only weapon which the church could use to bind its members together and which had been used from the beginning yet he would temper severity with mildness and charity since only god is able to judge the heart and herein he departed from the customs of the middle ages and did not regard the excommunicated as lost but to be prayed for by the faithful <laughs>
no one he maintained should be judged as deserving eternal death who was still in the hands of god he made a broad distinction between excommunication and anathema the latter he maintained should never or very rarely be pronounced since it takes away the hope of forgiveness and consigns one to the wrath of god and the power of satan he regarded the sacrament of the lord's supper as a means to help manifold infirmities as a time of meditation for beholding christ the crucified as confirming reconciliation with god is a visible sign of the body of christ recognizing his actual but spiritual presence luther recognized the bodily presence of christ in the eucharist while he rejected transubstantiation and the idea of worshiping the consecrated wafer as the real god this difference in the opinion of the reformers as to the eucharist led to bitter quarrels and controversies and divided the protestants calvin pursued a middle and moderate course and did much to harmonize the protestant churches he always sought peace and moderation and his tranquilizing measures were not pleasant to the catholics who wished to see divisions among their enemies calvin had a great dislike of ceremonies festivals holidays and the like for images he had an aversion amounting to horror christmas was the only festival he retained he was even slanderously accused of wishing to abolish the sabbath the observance of which he inculcated with the strictness of the puritans he introduced congregational singing but would not allow the ear or eye to be distracted the music was simple dispensing with organs and instruments in all elaborate and artistic display it is needless to say that this severe simplicity of worship has nearly passed away but cannot be doubted that the changes which the reformers made produced the deepest impression on the people in a fervent and religious age the psalms and hymns of the reformers were composed in times of great religious excitement calvin was far behind luther who did not separate the art of music from religion but calvin made a divorce of art from public worship indeed the reformation was not favorable to art in any form except in sacred poetry it declared those truths which save the soul rather than sought those arts which adorn civilization hence its churches were barren of ornaments and symbols and were cold and repulsive when the people were not excited by religious truths nor did they favor eloquence in the ordinary meaning of that word pulpit eloquence was simple direct and without rhetorical devices seeking effect not in gestures and postures and modulated voice but earnest appeals to the heart and conscience the great catholic preachers of the eighteenth century like bousset and bordelieu and massillon surpassed the protestants as rhetoricians end of section eighteen section nineteen of beacon lights of history volume six renaissance and reformation by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand john calvin part two the simplicity which marked the worship of god as established by calvin was also a feature in his system of church government he dispensed with bishops archdeacons deans and the like in his eyes every man who preached the word was a presbyter or elder and every presbyter was a bishop a deacon was an officer to take care of the poor not to preach and it was necessary that a minister should have a double call both an inward call and an outward call or an election by the people in union with the clergy paul and barnabas set forth elders but the people indicated their approval by lifting up their hands in the presbyterianism which calvin instituted he maintained that the church is represented by the laity as well as by the clergy he therefore gave the right of excommunication to the congregation in conjunction with the clergy in the lutheran church as in the catholic the right of excommunication was vested in the clergy alone but calvin gave to the clergy alone the right to administer the sacraments nor would he give to the church any other power of punishment than the exclusion from the lord's supper and excommunication his organization of the church was aristocratic placing the power in the hands of few men of approved wisdom and piety he had no sympathy with democracy either civil or religious and he formed a close union between church and state giving to the council the right to choose elders and to confirm the election of ministers as already stated he did not attempt to shield the clergy from the civil tribunals the consistory which assembled once a week was formed of elders and preachers and a messenger of the civil court summoned before it the persons whose presence was required no such power as this would be tolerated in these times but the consistory could not itself inflict punishment that was the province of the civil government the elders and clergy inflicted no civil penalties but simply determined what should be heard before the spiritual and what before the civil tribunal a syndic presided in the spiritual assembly at first but only as a church elder the elders were chosen from the council and the election was confirmed by the great council the people and preachers 
so that the church was really in the hands of the state which appointed the clergy it would thus seem that the church and state were very much mixed up together by calvin who legislated in view of the circumstances which surrounded him and not for other times or nations this subordination of the church to the state which was maintained by all the reformers was established in opposition to the custom of the catholic church who sought to make the state subservient to the church and the lay government of the church which entered into the system of calvin was owing to the fear that the clergy when able to stand alone might become proud and ambitious a fear which was grounded on the whole history of the church although calvin had an exalted idea of the spiritual dignity of the church he allowed a very dangerous interference of the state in ecclesiastical affairs even while he would separate the functions of the clergy from those of the magistrates he allowed the state to pronounce the final sentence on dogmatic questions and hence the powers of the synod failed in geneva moreover the payment of ministers by the state rather than by the people as in this country was against the old jewish custom which calvin so often borrowed for the priests among the jews were independent of the kings but calvin wished to destroy caste among the clergy and consequently spiritual tyranny in his legislation we see an intense hostility to the roman catholic church one of the animating principles of the reformers and hence the reformers in their hostility to rome went from scylla to charbidus calvin like all churchmen exalted naturally the theocratic idea of the old jewish and medieval church and yet practically put the church into the hands of laymen in one sense he was a spiritual dictator and like luther a sort of protestant pope and yet he built up a system which was fatal to spiritual power such as had existed among the catholic priesthood for their sacerdotal spiritual power he would substitute a moral power the result of personal bearing and sanctity it is amusing to hear some people speak of calvin as a ghostly spiritual father but no man ever fought sacerdotalism more earnestly than he the logical sequence of his ecclesiastical reforms was not the aristocratic and erastian church of scotland but the puritans in new england who were independents and not presbyterians yet there is an inconsistency even in calvin's regime for he had the zeal of the old catholic church in giving over to the civil power those he wished to punish as in the case of servetus he even intruded into the circle of social life and established a temporal rather than spiritual theocracy and while he overthrew the episcopal element he made a distinction not recognized in the primitive church between clergy and laity as for religious toleration it did not exist in any country or in any church there was no such thing as true evangelical freedom all the formers attempted as well as the catholics a compulsory unity of faith and this is an impossibility the reformers adopted a catechism or a theological system which all communicants were required to learn and accept this is substantially the acceptance of what the church ordains creeds are perhaps a necessity in well-organized ecclesiastical bodies and are not unreasonable but it should not be forgotten that they are formulated doctrines made by men on what is supposed to be the meaning of the scriptures and are not consistent with the right of private judgment when pushed out to its ultimate logical consequence when we remember how few men are capable of interpreting scripture for themselves and how few are disposed to exercise this right we can see why the formulated catechism proved useful in securing unity of belief but when protestant divines insisted on the acceptance of the articles of faith which they deduced from the scriptures they did not differ materially from the catholic clergy in persisting on the acceptance of the authority of the church as to matters of doctrine probably a church organization is impossible without a formulated creed such a creed has existed from the time of the council of nice and is not likely ever to be abandoned by any christian church in any future age although it may be modified and softened with the advance of knowledge however it is difficult to conceive of the unity of the church as to faith without a creed made obligatory on all the members of a communion to accept and it always has been regarded as a useful and even necessary form of christian instruction for the people calvin himself attached great importance to catechisms and prepared one even for children he also put great value on preaching instead of the complicated and imposing ritual of a catholic service and in most protestant churches from his day to ours preaching or religious instruction has occupied the most prominent part of the church service and it must be conceded that while the catholic service has often degenerated into mere rites and ceremonies to aid a devotional spirit so the protestant service has often become cold and rationalistic and it is not easy to say which extreme is the worse thus far we have viewed calvin in the light of a reformer and legislator but his influence as a theologian is more remarkable it is for his theology that he stands out as a prominent figure in the history of the church 
as such he showed greater genius as such he is the most eminent of all the reformers as such he impressed his mind on the thinking of his own age and of succeeding ages an original and immortal man his system of divinity embodied in his institutes is remarkable for the radiation of the general doctrines of the church around one central principle which he defended with marvellous logical power he was not a fencer like abelard displaying wonderful dexterity in the use of sophistries overwhelming adversaries by wit and sarcasm arrogant and self-sufficient and destroying rather than building up he did not deify the reason like erigina nor throw himself on authority like bernard he was not comprehensive like augustine nor mystical like bonaventura he had the spiritual insight of anselm and the dialectical acumen of thomas aquinas acknowledging no master but christ and implicitly receiving whatever the scriptures declared he takes his original position neither from natural reason nor from the authority of the church but from the word of god and from declarations of scripture as he interprets them he draws sequences and conclusions with irresistible logic in an important sense he is one-sided since he does not take cognizance of other truths equally important he is perfectly fearless in pushing out to its most logical consequences whatever truth he seizes upon and hence he appears to many gifted and learned critics to draw conclusions from accepted premises which apparently conflict with consciousness or natural reason and hence there has never been repugnance to many of his doctrines because it is impossible it is said to believe them in general calvin does not essentially differ from the received doctrines of the church as defended by its greatest lights in all ages his peculiarity is not in making a digest of divinity although he treated all the great subjects which have been discussed from athanasius to aquinas his institutes may well be called an exhaustive system of theology there is no great doctrine which he has not presented with singular clearness and logical force yet it is not for a general system of divinity that he is famous but for making prominent a certain class of subjects among which he threw the whole force of his genius in fact all the great lights of the church have been distinguished for the discussion of particular doctrines to meet the exigencies of their times thus athanasius is identified with the trinitarian controversy although he was a minister of the theological knowledge in general augustine directed his attention more particularly to the refutation of pelagian heresies and human depravity luther's great doctrine was justification by faith although he took the same ground as augustine it was the logical result of the doctrines of grace which he defended which led to the overthrow in half of europe of that extensive system of penance and self-expiation which marked the roman catholic church and on which so many glaring abuses were based as athanasius rendered a great service to the church by establishing the doctrine of the trinity and augustine a still greater service by the overthrow of pelagianism so luther undermined the papal pile of superstition by showing eloquently what indeed had been shown before the true ground of justification when we speak of calvin the great subject of predestination arises before our minds although on this subject he made no pretension to originality nor did he differ materially from augustine or gottschalk or thomas aquinas before him or pascal and edwards after him but no man ever presented this complicated and mysterious subject so ably as he it is not for me to discuss this great topic i simply wish to present the subject historically to give calvin's own views and the effect of his deductions on the theology of his age and in giving calvin's views i must shelter myself under the wings of his best biographer dr henry of berlin and quote the substance of his exposition of the peculiar doctrines of the swiss or rather french theologian according to henry calvin maintained that god in his sovereign will and for his own glory elected one part of the human race to everlasting life and abandoned the other part to everlasting death that man by the original transgression lost the power of free will except to do evil that it is only by divine grace that freedom to do good is recovered but that this grace is bestowed only on the elect and elect not in consequence of the foreknowledge of god but by his absolute decree before the world was made this is the substance of those peculiar doctrines which are called calvinism and by many regarded as fundamental principles of theology to be received with the same unhesitating faith as the declarations of scripture from which those doctrines are deduced augustine and aquinas accepted as substantially the same doctrines but they were not made so prominent in their systems nor were they so elaborately worked out the opponents of calvin including some of the brightest lights which have shone in the english church 
such men as jeremy taylor archbishop waitley and professor mosley affirm that these doctrines are not only opposed to free will but represent god as arbitrarily dooming a large part of the human race to future and endless punishment withholding from them his grace by which alone they can turn from their sins creating them only to destroy them not as the potter moulds the clays for vessels of honor and dishonor but moulding the clay in order to destroy the vessels he has made whether good or bad which doctrine they affirm conflicts with the views usually held out in the scriptures of god as a god of love and also conflicts with all natural justice and is therefore one-sided and narrow the premises from which this doctrine is deduced are those scripture texts which have the authority of the apostle paul such as these according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world for whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate jacob have i loved and esau have i hated he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy and on whom he will he hardeneth hath not the potter power over his clay no one denies that from these texts the predestination of calvin as well as augustine for they both had similar views is logically drawn it has been objected that both of these eminent theologians overlooked other truths which go in parallel lines and which would modify the doctrine even as scripture asserts in one place the great fact that the will is free and in another place that the will is shackled the pelagian would push out the doctrine of free will so as to ignore the necessity of grace and the augustinian would push out the doctrine of the servitude of the will into downright fatalism but these great logicians apparently shrink from the conclusions to which their logic leads them both augustine and calvin protest against fatalism and both assert that the will is so far free that the sinner acts without constraint and consequently the blame of his sins rests upon himself and not upon another the doctrines of calvin and augustine logically pursued would lead to the damnation of infants yet as a matter of fact neither maintained that to which their logic led it is not in human nature to believe such a thing even if it may be dogmatically asserted and then in regard to sin no one has ever disputed the fact that sin is rampant in this world and is deserving of punishment but theologians of the school of augustine and calvin in view of the fact have assumed the premise which indeed cannot be disputed that sin is against an infinite god hence that sin against an infinite god is itself infinite and hence that as sin deserves punishment an infinite sin deserves infinite punishment a conclusion from which consciousness recoils and which is nowhere asserted in the bible it is a conclusion arrived at by metaphysical reasoning which has very little to do with practical christianity and which imposed as a dogma of belief to be accepted like plain declarations of scripture is an insult to the human understanding but this conclusion involving the belief that inherited sin is infinite and deserving of infinite punishment appalls the mind for relief from this terrible logic the theologian adduces the great fact that christ made an atonement for sin another cardinal declaration of the scripture and that believers in this atonement shall be saved this bible doctrine is exceedingly comforting and accounts in a measure for the marvelous spread of christianity the wretched people of the old roman world heard the glad tidings that christ died for them as an atonement for the sins of which they were conscious and which had chained them to despair but another class of theologians deduced from this premise that as christ's death was an infinite atonement for the sins of the world so all men and consequently all sinners would be saved this was the ground of the original universalists deduced from the doctrines which augustine and calvin had formulated but they overlooked the scripture declaration which calvin never lost sight of that salvation was only for those who believed now inasmuch as a vast majority of the human race including infants have not believed it becomes a logical conclusion that all who have not believed are lost logic and consciousness then come into collision and there is no relief but in consigning these discrepancies to the realm of mystery I allude to these theological difficulties simply to show the tyranny to which the mind and soul are subjected whenever theological deductions are invested with the same authority as belongs to the original declarations of scripture and which so far from being systematized do not even always apparently harmonize almost any system of belief can be logically deduced from scripture texts it should be the work of the theologians to harmonize them and show their general spirit and meaning rather than to draw conclusions from any particular class of subjects any system of deductions from texts of scripture which are offset by texts of equal authority but apparently different meaning is necessarily one-sided and imperfect and therefore narrow that is exactly the difficulty under which calvin labored 
he seems to a large class of christians of great ability and conscientiousness to be narrow and one-sided and is therefore no authority to them not be it understood in reference to the great fundamental doctrines of christianity but in his views of predestination and the subjects interlinked with it and it was the great error of attaching so much importance to mere metaphysical divinity that led to such a revulsion from his peculiar system in after times it was the great wisdom of the english reformers like cranmer to leave all those metaphysical questions open as matters of comparatively little consequence and fall back on unquestioned doctrines of primitive faith that have given so great vitality to the english church and made it so broad and catholic the puritans as a body more intellectual than the mass of the episcopalians were led away by the imposing and entangling dialectics of the scholastic calvin and came unfortunately to attach as much importance to such subjects as free will and predestination questions most complicated as they did to the weightier matters of the law and when pushed by the logic of opponents to the decretum horrible have been compelled to fall back on the catholic doctrine of mysteries as something which could never be explained or comprehended but which it is a christian duty to accept as a mystery the scriptures certainly speak of mysteries like regeneration but it is one thing to marvel how a man can be born again by the spirit of god a fact we see every day and quite another thing to make a mystery to be accepted as a matter of faith of that which the bible has nowhere distinctly affirmed and which is against all ideas of natural justice and arrived at by a subtle process of dialectical reasoning but it was natural for so great an intellectual giant as calvin to make his startling deductions from the great truths he meditated upon with so much seriousness and earnestness only a very lofty nature would have reveled as he did and as augustine did before him and pascal after him in those great subjects which pertain to god and his dispensations all his meditations and formulated doctrines radiate from the great and sublime idea of the majesty of god and the comparative insignificance of man and here he was not so far apart from the great sages of antiquity before salvation was revealed by christ canst thou by searching find out god what is man that thou art mindful of him End of section 19.